Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here and not in Sacramento or Los Angeles for the time being, um, where I can report to you that there is work proceeding on the California high-speed rail. There's no cause for skepticism, and it will be done in about a year. <laughs> <laughs> We wish. You know, I, I'm reminded, we've worked on a number of public-private partnerships, uh, not just in the United States, but also abroad. And I'm, I'm always uh, surprised when I come back to the United States after uh, a trip to Europe or a trip to Asia to, to remember not just how we've let our, our, our investment in infrastructure lapse, and not just how we're lagging behind uh, large parts of the world, and not just uh, developed parts of the world, uh, in, in maintaining and expanding uh, our, our infrastructure, but I'm also surprised at how much we built over the last 150 years. We have in some ways been burdened by a tremendously successful and large investment in infrastructure, which has blinded us to the need to maintain, upgrade, and expand that infrastructure to keep pace with economic growth and with, with population uh, and with development and globalization in, in markets. So. In looking at public-private partnerships and bringing that skill set to bear in the United States, uh, it's important to realize that we have a very immature market in the United States. We, we do not have as much experience uh, with innovative financing techniques where the public sector and the private sector come together uh, as they do in other parts of the world, as they do in France, as they do in England, as they do in Australia, as they are starting to do in uh, wide parts of Latin America, as they've done for years in Chile. Uh, as they've done in Mexico, uh, and as they're doing elsewhere uh, around the world. So what can we learn about best practices from elsewhere as we develop our, our public-private uh, partnership market, or P3 market, here in the States? First, uh, I think it's important to define what we're talking about when we say public-private partnership, because the words are thrown around a lot. They have a different meaning for people with a real estate background than they do for people with a transportation background. Uh, and, and I guess I would, I would say fundamentally the point is not to be looking for the private sector to provide money and then move on and call that a partnership because that's not really what it's about. So what is it about? When the government provides a public service, and that may be providing water, it may be providing rail uh, or road connections, it may be providing power in many parts of the world, there's a service which the government can do a number of different ways. One way is to do it itself. State-owned enterprises provide uh, most of the services in many parts of the world. Uh, power, energy, just to take a, a slight detour, in the U.S. largely is in private hands. We do have, of course, very large federal agencies, uh, Bonneville, uh, uh, TVA, which uh, generate electricity and, and distribute it over wide areas. We certainly have municipal uh, utilities. Uh, I live in Los Angeles, LADWP is one of the largest utilities, public or private, it happens to be public, uh, in, in the country. Uh, and and that's, that's a model where you don't need to regulate it because there's no real private actor. And the idea is that under that model, uh, the rate payers or the constituents will, through political means, through their elected boards or through appointed boards, uh, uh, ensure a quality of service, reliability, and uh, uh, either lower or at least fair costs and universal service. Look at transportation as the other extreme in the United States. Uh, because in the public utility area, that's actually the minority. Most people in the United States get their power from a private utility regulated by a regulator. And so that next step along the spectrum of having a private actor who may have a monopoly control uh, regulated uh, becomes very important. And if you look at rail in the United States, historically, private rail lines, uh, historically, uh, before Amtrak's formation, of course, uh, both for passenger and freight, uh, were, were regulated either by state or increasingly by federal regulators over the last 200, 250 years. Uh, and that was a model which had some benefits and had some uh, inherent flaws. Uh, it, on the passenger side, of course, led to direct provision of passenger service, again, really mainly being in government hands, in contrast to freight, in contrast to other types of infrastructure. So we have a choice. The government can do it itself. The government can regulate an activity and allow private companies to compete and provide service subject to that regulatory oversight. But there's a third way, and this is where public-private partnerships come in. And that's to have a, con a contract, some kind of an agreement that regulates the private sector for a particular project. And that contract, whether it's a concession agreement or a franchise agreement, 
is the way in which the public sector invites in the private actor, sets up the rules by which that private actor will act, and makes them accountable. And from the private side, it defines the market. It creates the market opportunity. So if, for instance, there's to be a high-speed rail line between Milwaukee and Chicago, at least three governments have to be involved, not, not setting aside for a moment uh, the, the, the critical role played by, by local and municipal governments, the federal government and the state governments of Illinois and Wisconsin. So right there, you have an agreement which will be entered into by one or more parties if that were to be, for example, a public-private partnership, where a right is being given to build or operate or both a rail line in a certain designated path and ultimately a certain designated right of way. Not anybody can just go out there and start digging up the, the, the road and, and uh, uh, digging up the parks and digging up the, the houses in order to build a rail line. You've got to have the state's permission. But if you're going to run that line, you have to be accountable to the government. And if it's not under a system of regulation, it will be under that public-private partnership project agreement, which creates that opportunity and defines that market for the investors. In California, the, the, the voters approved uh, the issuance of bonds, of state debt, to finance the, the development of the California High Speed Rail Project. But embedded in that legislation, and one of the strong, I think, recommendations of it to many voters who supported that when it, when it passed, was the idea of public-private partnerships, of the private sector co-investing and co-operating or operating uh, that facility uh, once it's built. So this idea was, gee, you used the, the public monies really as seed capital to acquire right-of-way, to run environmental approval process uh, as, as necessary, uh, to do preliminary engineering and design so that the project could mature to a point where it might be attractive to a private sector uh, and to have multiple bidders perhaps come in for either portions of that system, maybe for the whole network. It could be designed in any number of ways. That obviously is a huge system and lends itself very, I think, uh, better to breaking it up into smaller components. Uh, but the idea is to use that public money to attract not just private money, but private expertise and to develop the project. There's a philosophical shift which is required for that kind of a partnership to be formed. The shift is this. We're moving away from procurement of a facility and into procurement of mobility, procurement of a service, right? You tell the private sector not that they have to come in with the lowest cost bid to build the cheapest facility, irrespective of how well it may last and irrespective of efficiencies. Rather, the idea in a public-private partnership is for the government to say to the private sector, come in and give us value for money. Value is a word we haven't heard enough of uh, in the last day and a half, but value is critical and value creation is critical to understanding why the P3 model can work for high-speed rail and for other kinds of infrastructure. So what do I mean by that? Well, in working with our clients on these P3 projects in, in other, especially non-rail areas of transportation where they've been successfully implemented in the U.S., uh, the, the value for money has to look at life cycle cost. It may be that the capital costs are a little higher if that means that the service will be more reliable or that it will last longer for a period of years, that will require less uh, investment in, in ongoing uh, upgrades uh, and maintenance in order to ensure that at the end of, a, say, a concession term in, say, 30 or 40 or 50 years, the facility is like new because it's maintained like new. Uh, and not like so many of the crumbling bridges and, 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 and roads and things that we see around us today that have not been maintained to that kind of standard. Uh, and if that kind of value engineering is built in up front because the private sector has the risk of both building it and, and operating it for a period of decades, uh, then you actually end up with lower life cycle costs for the, in, for the entire project over time and more reliable, higher quality service. That's the goal to have lower life cycle costs, that's the value for the money, and to have better service, more mobility. Let people get from San Francisco to Los Angeles faster and on time with more frequent service than they might be able to do if they had to rely on their own car or a bus or, or Southwest Airlines, right? Let them do that throughout Texas. Let them do that in, 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 in regions where you have appropriate population density in the upper Midwest and in the Northeast Corridor. The public-private partnership is not designed fundamentally to bring in capital, because there's lots of ways to raise money, taxes, 
uh, fair box revenues that can be monetized even by, by governments, uh, federal grants, state grants, uh, other kinds of user fees. We, we, can, we, can, we can spread the cost of this as widely as we want or try to keep it uh, focused on users of a particular facility. At the end of the day, the public-private partnership is meant to pull in expertise uh, and, and value creation through accountable contracts that have intelligent allocation of risk. And I think that risk allocation uh, has to be uh, uh, foremost in the minds of both governments and anybody who's in the private sector looking to invest resources and time and personnel into chasing high-speed rail projects in this country. Because allocating risks to parties best able to handle them makes sense, creates efficiency, and reduces costs. Allocating risks unwisely results in people either paying too much or getting too little or, or projects failing. One last note, uh, and this would be political risk, uh, and I think it's relevant. Um, I, I remember when I was working on the Hill before going to law school uh, in the early and mid-1980s, and, and the phone rang in the office where I was a young legislative assistant working on transportation and energy issues. And at the other end of the phone was a gentleman uh, from our district. Our district was upstate New York. At the time, it was uh, uh, our representative, my boss, was Congressman Frank Horton, who is a liberal Republican, words that don't go together too much anymore, but we, we did have such things at one time. Uh, and uh, Mr. Horton was opposed to the appropriation that was up for a vote to build the red line, the initial stage of the subway in Los Angeles. Well, why should somebody from Rochester support a subway in LA? What's the national interest in that? Why send more money back to the West Coast? And the man on the phone said, you know, up here in Rochester, we have a company which has a contract for signal equipment for the LA subway if that bill goes through. And we understand your boss is opposed to it. We'd like to tell you there's 45 jobs at stake in his district. We'd sure like your support. Hmm. I told him this, and he made five phone calls, which created five votes, which meant that instead of that bill failing by three, it passed by two. And that's why LA has a subway today, and which is part of an expanding uh, regional transportation network. Building political support from and looking in unlikely places for it is critical to this. And the, f the, f the single biggest concern that foreign investors, many of our clients have when they're coming into the US market, whether it's for high-speed rail or other kinds of infrastructure, is political risk. Will the projects be selected in a way where it's fair uh, and where uh, there's consistent political will supporting the project all the way through, from planning, from project selection, from procurement and fair procurement pro uh, 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 and, and bid procedures, all the way through negotiating the concession agreement, getting the financing in place, through construction and through into operation. The idea that the rules are changing, that with a change in governments in any particular place, the rug could be pulled out from under you in a moment, uh, is very, very disconcerting to, to many companies that have a choice of where in the world they'd like to invest. High-speed rail makes absolute sense for economic and political reasons in many parts of the United States, and it presents a very real opportunity, uh, maybe a dripping roast for some potential investors uh, from the United States and also from abroad, from Europe and, and from Asia. Uh, but for this to make sense for people who are going to be using these networks, for the governments and the politicians that need to support them, and for the private sector that would be asked to take on significant risks in, in construction and operation and efficiencies of these projects, there has to be less uncertainty around the political environment and the support for these projects, and more partnership truly between the public and private sector. And with that, I'll, I'll leave it to other speakers and take your questions afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Alex.